Alone is what I have. Alone protects me. Nope. Friends protect people. The loner genius is an enduring myth in our culture. Think Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Will Hunting, Bobby Fischer, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I don't have friends. The famous fictional detective seems like the quintessential example of the archetype. He's an arrogant, isolated brainiac, unburdened by social etiquette, who sacrifices relationships and suppresses emotion to get the job done. Sentiment is a chemical defect found in the losing side. But what's interesting about the BBC series Sherlock is that it actually rejects this loner genius myth and proves it to be a lie. Over the course of the show, we watch Sherlock slowly open up, recognize that he can't solve all problems alone, and occasionally rest his logical brain to exercise his empathy muscles. So if I didn't understand I was being asked to be best man, it is because I never expected to be anybody's best friend. And certainly not the best friend or the bravest and kindest and wisest human being I have ever had the good fortune of knowing. So let's look at how this truly modern incarnation of Sherlock challenges our society's popular and damaging assumption that greatness only comes in the package of an unfeeling misanthrope. I play the violin when I'm thinking. Sometimes I don't talk for days on and Would that bother you? Potential flatmates should know the worst about each other. Before we go on, we want to talk a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Photography, illustration, music production. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. As a culture, we're fascinated by geniuses. From real life intellects like Stephen Hawking to fictional ones like Gregory House. If it weren't for my obsessions, you would know that she has sarcoidosis. Not everyone agrees on what defines genius and whether it's genetic or created, but many of the geniuses we see on screen share similar traits and capabilities, like extraordinary deductive skills, a near photographic memory, and fast paced speech. I went to my friend for the money because that's who I wanted to be partners with. Suggesting a lightning quick mind we mortals can't keep up with. Dear God, what is it like in your funny little brains? It must be so boring. Along with these strengths, these genius characters also tend to have darker traits, like obsessive tendencies, the lack of a filter, and generally antisocial behavior. I'm not a psychopath, Anderson. I'm a high-functioning sociopath. Do your research. Audiences love watching geniuses, even when they're unlikable, because this archetype is a kind of superhero of the brain. Like Batman responding to the bat signal in Gotham, Sherlock steps in to save the day. It means when the police are out of their depth, which is always, they consult me. These geniuses perform impossible mental athletics, solving problems and uncovering truths that we can't access on our own. Even their bad qualities make them entertaining to live through. With their lack of regard for social norms, they freely say those things we think but never dare speak. If you're dying, suddenly everybody loves you. Mr. Zuckerberg, do I have your full attention? No. I don't need therapy. That's enough, get out. Ah. Portrayals of geniuses on TV typically say a lot about the culture that produced them. Over the past decade, a lot of our genius depictions have come in the form of tech gurus, like Mark Zuckerberg in The Social Network or Richard in Silicon Valley. I'm a coder, Jared, so I'm gonna code. So what does that tell us? Evidently, that we're a culture obsessed with technology, that we think of tech as a hub for high intellect and genius innovation. Sherlock almost channels this tech guru type of our times, but instead of operating technology, he treats his mind like a computer. So Sherlock essentially is the tech himself. He takes a technical approach to thought using the Mind Palace memorization technique, visualizing a complex physical space where he can store and access a curated set of memories. Yeah. A, a map with a location it doesn't have to be a real place and then you deposit memories there theoretically you can never forget anything all you have to do is find your way back to it like a computer sherlock has a finite amount of storage space to work with he stores memories from his past cases but deletes information he deems irrelevant to his work this is my hard drive and it only makes sense to put things in there that are useful really useful his thought process is even visually portrayed in a way that evokes his internet searches 
Yet Sherlock's character journey guides him away from his loner existence and away from viewing himself as a computer. Instead of emulating a cyborg by terminating his relationships and burying his emotions, Sherlock ultimately finds success by developing human connections. John, I am a ridiculous man, redeemed only by the warmth and constancy of your friendship. When we first meet our detective, he checks off all the boxes for the loner genius archetype. He has no real friends. I was wondering if you'd like to have coffee. Black, two sugars, please. I'll be upstairs. He's arrogant and intellectually superior. This investigation might move a bit quicker if you were to take my word as gospel. Has a razor sharp eye for detail. Your face is tanned, but no tan above the wrists. You've been abroad, but not sunbathing. And speaks at a rapid fire pace. Just think it's a small dog, probably a terrier. In fact, it is a West Highland terrier called Whiskey. How the hell do you know that, Sherlock? Because she was on the same train as us and I heard her calling its name. And that's not cheating, that's listening. I use my senses, John, like some people. But then John Watson enters the picture. Yeah, well, this is more fun. Fun? There's a woman lying dead. Watson accepts his new friend as he is. I'm your best Man. friend. Yeah, of course you are. Of course. You're my best friend despite being advised otherwise. Stay away from Sherlock Holmes. And he ultimately makes Sherlock both a better person. Go after her and apologize. Apologize. And a better detective. There are lives at stake, Sherlock. Actual human life. Just, just so I know, do you care about that at all? From there, we watch Sherlock steadily develop his compassion throughout the series. As he exposes human vulnerability. I want to be able to keep myself distant. Divorce myself from feelings. But look, you see, but he's betraying me. And shows that he does care for the people around him. Contrary to what the loner genius myth would have us believe, this doesn't hinder his work. He continues to do what he does best, solve problems and close cases that perplex the police. Did you notice that? I like the arrogance to ignore details. I'm not the police. Sherlock makes the best man speech at Watson and Mary's wedding, telling stories about the empathy and skill that Watson brings to their cases, how he couldn't do the job without him. I will solve your murder, but it takes John Watson to save your life. With Watson's help, Sherlock meets his goals in a more fulfilling way. So we watch these two learn from each other and grow into an iconic dynamic duo. This is a private matter. John stays. This is family. That's why he stays. And as Sherlock finds success in his career through building meaningful relationships. I hope you'll be very happy, Molly Hooper. You deserve it. The series subtly departs from the loner genius myth. Then in season four, it goes even further, rejecting the myth outright. We meet Sherlock's psychopath sister, Eurus, whose intellectual capacity is far greater than Sherlock's and their brother Mycroft's. I added some deductions for Sherlock. It was quite good, but he didn't get the big one. She's also even more unfeeling. Yura seems to lack any semblance of empathy. We have evolved to attach an emotional significance to what is nothing more than the survival strategy of the pack animal. Yuras challenges Sherlock in a series of ruthless tests with life or death stakes. She forces him to choose between killing Mycroft or Watson. You have to choose family or friend. And his response surprises his sister. No, no, Sherlock. Self-sacrifice is not something Eurus can understand. Before this point, Sherlock repressed memories of his sister, who was locked up in the high security facility Sharon Ford due to her history of violence. You killed my best friend. He essentially evicted her from his mind palace. But while it may seem rational to cut difficult people out and detach from emotional messiness, this approach doesn't work. It's only by working through his feelings that Sherlock eventually finds a lasting solution to his dilemma. The final problem comes when Sherlock is put on the phone with a young girl aboard a plane full of unconscious passengers headed for a crash. Given no context, Sherlock has to help her. All right, well, you and I are gonna have to drive this plane together. But we eventually learn that in actuality, there is no young girl or crashing plane. This simulation is a kind of metaphor for Eurus. She's up in the sky, symbolic of the great heights she can reach with her unmatched genius, but she's all alone, with no one who can relate to her. And this is a perilous existence. 
You're high above us all, alone in the sky, and you understand everything except how to land. Now, I'm just an idiot. I'm on the ground. I can bring you home. Ultimately, Sherlock solves the problem by empathizing with Eurus. He's simply there for her, despite her past actions and the villainous role she's been playing. I am here. You're not lost anymore. This sends the message that not only is it okay for our detective genius to embrace his humanity, but it's also a vast improvement to his prowess as a detective. Sherlock's newfound emotional fortitude makes him smarter than his sister ever was. Because unfeeling logic isn't the only ingredient in intelligence. Sometimes true genius resides in our capacity to feel. You were the best man, uh, the most human, human being that I've ever known. It's hard not to notice that today's popular depictions of geniuses feel pretty homogenous. Almost all are white men. For the record, she may look like a 34C, but she's getting all kinds of help from our friends at Victoria's Secret. She's a 34B, as in barely anything there. False advertising. A 2017 New York Times article investigated the real-life implications of the loner genius myth in tech. And it pointed out how, by rewarding loner behavior, companies can thwart diversity. Shortly before this, a Google engineer was fired for writing that women aren't suited to work in tech because they care more about feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas, and people rather than things. And this sparked a conversation about our society's false notions about what it takes to work in tech. I haven't had more than two straight hours of sleep in months. I've had a cold for like a year. <laughs> like that you have to be able to divorce yourself from emotion. And it's more impressive to work alone than be part of a team. In a society where it feels increasingly unrealistic for one person to be able to affect change, the myth of the loner genius becomes all the more alluring. It plays into our desire for individual agency. We love stories of glorious breakthroughs by one protagonist, the genius. Instead of more realistic tales of innovation accomplished by countless people putting in unglamorous hard work for little credit. As Marjorie Garber wrote for The Atlantic, we prefer the myth. Edison invented the electric light bulb and the phonograph. Never mind that he worked with an extensive team of technicians, mechanics, and scientists. The trademark of antisocial behavior in genius narratives emphasizes this idea that the figure acts and innovates on his own. I deleted all our modules last night and I completely rebuilt our engine from scratch. What better way to illustrate a character's agency than to make him an island? So we look to this loner type to fantasize about what it's like to be all-powerful in a society where we tend to feel anything but. But all this is damaging because on-screen portrayals of geniuses impact how we think about and label geniuses in real life. I sat in a garage with Wozniak and invented the future because artists lead and hacks ask for a show of hands. The loner genius stereotype perpetuates misconceptions about how intelligent people look and act. And the reality is that empathy, collaboration, and diversity are crucial elements of success in the workplace and in our personal lives. He's a great man, sir. No, he's better than that. He's a good one. Sherlock stands out for his eventual ability to grow beyond his cyborg tech bro characteristics. Thanks, Greg. Yes, this portrayal of genius still takes the form of a white male protagonist. But the series takes a step forward by recognizing the importance of empathy in problem solving. While a genius doesn't have to be socially inclined, it's equally true that isolating yourself is not a prerequisite for being successful. All this came from you. No, all this came from that. The point is that brains come in all kinds of packages. And so the BBC's updated version of the genius, who's aided by friends and his inner humanity, has the potential to inspire far more diverse, nuanced portraits of intellect in the future. It's not a pleasant thought, John, but I have this terrible feeling from time to time that we might all just be human. Would you jump at the chance to have Roxanne Gay as your creative writing teacher? Or to learn about stop motion from an Oscar-nominated filmmaker? Is this the year you'll finally dive into DSLR photography? Have you been meaning to start keeping a sketchbook? Skillshare can help you turn those intentions into something concrete. 
Here at The Take, we want to improve our animation know-how, and we're using Skillshare to do it. They offer more than 25,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, you can get two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description below. So don't wait. Try Skillshare today.